So now that we've talked about different complex number operations in kind of a general sense, let's go ahead and work some specific examples with some actual numbers here. So in this example of addition, we're going to work with the complex number Z1, which is equal to 7 plus J4, and the complex number Z2, which is equal to a negative 2 plus J times 1.5, and we're going to compute the sum Z equals Z1 plus Z2. So to compute this sum as a first step, I just replace Z1 with what it's equal to, and Z2 with what it's equal to. And then for complex number addition, we know what we do. We take the real parts, which are 7 and negative 2, and we put those together. And we take the imaginary parts, which are 4 and 1.5, and we add those together. So 7 minus 2 is 5, and 4 plus 1.5 is 5.5. So the sum of Z1 and Z2 is the new complex number Z, which is equal to 5 plus J times 5.5. Let's go ahead and work with the same numbers, Z1 and Z2, but do multiplication. So here in this example, we're going to compute the product Z, which is a complex number, equal to the product of Z1 and Z2. So again, I just start by writing down what Z1 and Z2 are equal to. And then we know how to do this. We just do this with the FOIL method, just like we do in algebra. So we take the first, 7 times a negative 2 is a negative 14. Then the outer, 7 times 1.5 is 10.5, but there's a j there, so I have to carry along the j. And then the inner, j4 times a negative 2 is a negative j8. And then finally, the last components, j4 times j1.5, there's two j's, so I end up with a j squared. And 4 times 1.5 is 6, so I end up with 6 there. And then on this next line, the only thing I've done is I've simplified what j squared is. j is the square root of a negative 1. So that squared gives me a minus sign, so that turns into a negative 6. And now I just combine like terms. I grab the real components, which are negative 14 and negative 6, and I put those here. And I take the imaginary components, which are 10.5 and 8, and I put those here. So a negative 14 minus 6 is a negative 20, and 10.5 minus 8 is 1.5, so I end up with J 1.5. Let's do an example of conjugation. This is almost trivial, but let's just do an example to be complete here. Same numbers, Z1 and Z2, and I'm going to compute their conjugates, Z1 conjugate and Z2 conjugate. So starting with Z1, I write down what Z1 is. I need to take the conjugate of this quantity. Remember what the conjugate does. It takes all the j's and turns them into negative j's. So this j right here gets replaced with a negative j. So we get the complex number 7 minus j4. Similarly for Z2, if I want to compute its conjugate, I write down Z2, I take the conjugate of the whole thing, and then everywhere in here where I see a J, I change it to a negative J, so I end up with a negative 2 minus J times 1.5. So we've computed the conjugate of Z1 and the conjugate of Z2. Next, let's do an example of computing the magnitude of some complex numbers. So the same Z1 and Z2 we've been working with, and now I'm going to compute the magnitude of Z1 and the magnitude of Z2. So to compute the magnitude of Z1, remember by definition, the magnitude of a complex number is the square root of the complex number times its complex conjugate. So we know what Z1 is, so I put it right here. We just computed what the conjugate of Z1 is. It's Z minus J4. To compute this product, we know how to do that. It's just the first. So 7 times 7 is 49. Then plus the outer, which is 7 times a negative J4 plus the inner, which is J4 times 7, so those cancel. This term gives me a negative 28J, this term gives me plus 28J, so those are going to cancel. And then the last term is when multiplied, give me a J squared, which is negative, so it cancels this negative, turns it positive, and 4 times 4 is 16. So this always happens when we compute the magnitude, these inner terms always cancel, and you're really just left with this squared, plus this squared. So 49 plus 16, if you add that together you get 65, so the magnitude of Z1 is the square root of 65. We can do the exact same steps to compute the magnitude of Z2. By definition, the magnitude of a complex number is the square root of itself times its complex conjugate, so that's what I have right here. If we want to think about this how we did before, what I end up with here after the things cancel are just this first term squared, so a negative 2 squared is 4, and this last term squared, 1.5 squared is 2.25. So if I add those two together, 4 plus 2.25 is 6.25. So the magnitude of Z2 is the square root of 6.25.
Let's go ahead and do the angle computation. Now we just computed their magnitude. Let's compute their angle or phase as well. So if I want to compute the angle of Z1, remember how we do that. We take the tan inverse of the imaginary component divided by the real component. So the imaginary component of Z1 is 4, and the real component of Z1 is 7. So if I plug this into my calculator, the tan inverse of 4 sevenths is 0.5191, and this is in radians. This is not degrees. Similarly, to compute the angle of Z2, I take the tan inverse of the real part, which is a negative 2, so that goes in the numerator, divided by the imaginary part of Z2. If I look at Z2, the imaginary part is 1.5, so that goes on to the denominator. Again, if I use my calculator to compute this quantity, I get 2.4981 radians. So we now know what the phase or angle of these complex numbers is. Let's go ahead and write these complex numbers in polar format now. Remember what polar format is. It's a way to write a complex number in terms of its magnitude times e raised to its phase. So we've already done these computations. We computed the magnitude of z1. We found that it was equal to the square root of 65. And on the very last slide, we computed the angle of z1 and found that it was equal to 0.5191. So one way to write z1 is in the rectangular form of 7 plus j4. An equivalent way to write z1 is in polar format, square root of 65 times e to the 0 0.5191. Same thing for z2. z2 in polar format is the magnitude of z2, e raised to the angle of z2. Well, we just did these computations, so that's square root of 6.25 times e to the 2.4981. Let's go ahead and plot these complex numbers in the complex plane now. So here is a plot of the numbers z1 and z2, and I can think of this e any way that I want. I can think of it in rectangular form. I can think of z1 as coming out 7, and then going up 4, and landing right there on that dot z1, right here. Or I can think about it as going out a magnitude, what was it, square root of 65, and then rotating up about 0.5 radians, and I would end up in that exact same spot. Same thing for z2. One way to think about plotting z2 is to come on the real axis down negative 2 and then going up on the imaginary axis 1.5 to end at this spot right here. The other way to think about it is to come out on the real axis, square root of 6.25, and then rotate about 2.5 radians and end up right there at that spot. So no matter whether you think of it in terms of rectangular coordinates or in terms of um, polar coordinates like we just did on the previous slide, those are both identical. They give you the exact same spot in the complex plane. It just depends on how you want to think about it. So that concludes this video of working some very specific examples of performing operations on complex numbers. We did addition, we did multiplication, conjugation, computing the magnitude, computing the angle, and plotting complex numbers in the complex plane. In the next video, we'll actually walk through doing these operations in MATLAB. So if you use MATLAB for any of your work, we'll show how to do these computations using MATLAB software.